Okay, so we'll be spending the the next 45 minutes together kind of in a loose informal structure just having a conversation about this thing we just did um and i wanted to before anything um ask sarita and ranji to begin the conversation kind of kick us off um how are you both feeling what is what is it what's coming up for you in this moment a day after publishing the the primer and i'll start with you sarita because this um this idea originated from from you i want to ask where did this idea come from um i want to know like did it meet your expectations did you know that it was going to be such a journey <laughs> doing this how are you feeling hi everybody uh, so great to be with you today thank you Rigo, for asking me that question um in the spirit of the day i just wanted to point out that i'm talking to you from canarsie land uh, and i'm paying tribute in this conversation and many others to all the incredible pathways that the Canarsie people lay down all around me and, and make my life pass, possible and, and uh, make the world that I live in. And, um, you know, I think I'll start with the last question, which is about how, how I'm feeling about the project uh, with a little story, which is just two days ago. I live a lot of my life now alternating, toggling between WhatsApp and Signal. <laughs> That's just how life is, I'm sure, for a lot of people. And a friend of mine who's in Canada contacted me over WhatsApp, extremely frustrated. She's putting together a syllabus on digital media and wrote, hey, I would like to have some authors who are actually working from the continent of Africa and writing about digital media in Africa. And I'm extremely frustrated because everything I'm reading is from a Euro US perspective. And I immediately thought, okay, I can answer this one and pulled up the syllabus and basically sent her everything that was on the syllabus that had to do with um, African media cultures, Afro modernities, uh, Latin Caribbean connections. And that to me is sort of what I was trying to achieve with this project and where the idea came from, because you know, it, the idea came to me in a uh, academic conference setting, a setting that Ranjit organized. This this conference called 4S. And as I was listening to everyone give their talks, which were so amazing, I thought, you know, this field of AI slash rest of world, global south majority world is growing rapidly and everyone in this room is speaking from the perspective of those worlds yet i know that in general those are precisely the voices that get erased and what i wanted to do with the syllabus project is to put together at least some of those voices knowing that it's always incomplete so we have a resource that then we can share in precisely that way um, and it's been an amazing journey. It's been a really long journey uh, with a lot of very, very fascinating conversations along the way. And maybe this is a question I'd love to kick over to Rigo and Ranjit, but so many, many of the discussions in this group and elsewhere are about things that initially you would think are not that important, like what something looks like, what images to use, Questions of translation in Spanish, they have been so fascinating because each of those is actually about epistemologies and relationships of power. And so that, I think, is the thing that have surprised me the most and, and thrilled me the most, the amount of care that everyone took to really get those things as good as we could in alignment as we could with the goals of the project. And it's really time consuming to do that. That's that's a wonderful cue for me because uh, I was kind of uh, hoping to talk a little bit about process and you know this kind of brings up that question really nicely and segues into it beautifully. 
Um, I remember this one time when uh, Sarita and you know the three of us were having a chat about how to do the syllabus, and uh, Sarita suggested that you know the the trick to do a syllabus is to provide a form and let people fill it out. Uh, so you know. Uh, we created a document and we just wrote up a couple of things that kind of gave a sense of okay this might this is what it might look like uh and then you know we hope that you know over time uh as people come in and look at what we have in terms of form there'll be new content that comes in right and it was interesting because you know my my thought process on this issue was probably at the other end of the spectrum i was deeply interested in content so you know i started basically just filling out references that i knew of as a way to basically push and provide some direction in terms of thinking about, okay, how do we actually uh, fill out these different sections of the syllabus that we have and what would it look like and stuff like that. I think the start, explore and extend idea was beautiful because it kind of allowed for some of this conversation to be passed out in ways where, you know, uh, you know, you can have, you can dip into certain topics and then not have to deal with them comprehensively and that's fine because you know you you have your own interest in terms of thinking about the space and doing this research in the first place uh, <clears throat> and then of course all the meetings which you know uh, rigo kind of held together in terms of thinking through what should be its cadence how do we actually organize this and stuff like that so it's been it's been an interesting way to think about how each one of us adds a different element to this uh, matrix of what the syllabus kind of becomes uh, in in collaboration with all the rest of you here, uh, and you know that to a certain extent brings me to conversations around what would a translation look like. Initially, we had this idea that we are going to translate into ten languages, which thankfully we dropped. <laughs> Doing one was enough. <laughs> uh but at the same time you know uh these choices around okay what would the image look like how does how does it flow uh having a having a structure of a primer taking inspiration from the previous primer on uh powerful numbers that data and society had produced also helped in terms of just giving it some kind of design direction in terms of thinking about okay this is this is what it might look like but it doesn't look anything like it anymore which is also fascinating. It kind of grows in a way where you know all of the contributions that we've had on this project kind of sh have shaped it in a way where it has taken a form that, to be honest, uh, you know, Sarita was right. You know, just provide the form because the content keeps changing, and that's what happened <laughs> in a way. So I'll leave it at that for ego. Yeah, no, that's a that's a beautiful segue into this conversation about process. Um, so much of what I do in my day-to-day -day life um, at DNS and in other places is <clears throat> try to kind of ascertain a, a true north. Like what, how do we take an idea and substantiate it so that we arrive at a, a final product? And often the case is that what you end up with is not at all what you imagined you were going to set out to do. But that's kind of the beauty of of the production process. You <clears throat> kind of sell into sell off into this this journey of really discovering what it is you're trying to say and what it is you're trying to do, and use all these ways and tactics and um, strategies to to kind of arrive at that. So it's more about <clears throat> revealing what is there, and instead of actually like producing anything original um anything kind of like objectively original it's it's more about kind of being okay with living in this messy garden garden of forking paths which which i love uh Divya's contribution <clears throat> and allowing yourself to kind of get get lost in it with with a high level of rigor dedication and uh really just curiosity about what it is that, that we're trying to create together and in this case, for the primer, <clears throat> um, we started off with, with the notion of creating a syllabus, uh, really making some kind of pedagogical tool that um, might be accessible to educators, uh, scholars. And we ended up with, with, this, um, with this primer. I don't even really know what 
what what kind of a tool it is it's it's a it is a, a garden of working paths that you can kind of go in and get lost in but for me what was important is to have like 12 12 to 13 really strong um yeah a net some kind of a uh mycelial kind of like web of 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 threads that you can pull on in this case it's 13 12 or 13 really solid categories for understanding or uh, even for for just to, for framing what the conversation is um and i think of all the 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 things that i've read around uh, data-driven technologies within and uh, amongst the, the diaspora and the global south. What this primer offers, I think, is um, uh, an array of, of threads to, to begin uh, your own inquiry um, in a way that keeps it real, you know, like we talk about <clears throat> um, kind of theoretical frameworks uh, but also some grounded realities that are being lived lived in right now. Um, that's that's one of the things that I've been kind of missing in the AI conversation. It's like, can we just keep it real for a sec? Like, can we talk about what is this manifesting in, in people's everyday lives? How is this changing the kind of <clears throat> the connective tissue of everyday lived existence for so many people around the world? Um, and can we kind of operate at from that, from that place, instead of uh, operating from like very high level policy conversations, which tend to be the norm in the kind of AI ethics realm. So I'll, I'll kind of start there and invite folks to, to contribute their thoughts around how, how this primer informs their work and, um, your own experiences, your own everyday life experiences with trying to unpack and understand um, how these technologies are, are shifting reality. Um, and I think I'll, I'll pass it to Divya just because I, I named you and uh, I wanna know, like, what is the garden of forking paths for you? Why cite uh, Borges in, in this case? Uh, and how do you attribute kind of the ways that AI is shifting reality uh, in your experience. Uh, thanks, Rigo. That's uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to speak. And I have firstly, I would like to acknowledge the generosity of this community, because without that generosity, I think uh, this conversation wouldn't have moved this far. And um, there's uh, there's two answers. The first answer is a uh, is, is the facetious answer, which is the garden of working paths is since working with data and society, I've moved three institutions. So I'm guessing that this is the place that has helped me fork into different places, countries. So that's the, that's the facetious answer. The relatively serious answer is um, when, when Ranjit brought uh, the conversation together, because I remember starting this conversation with Ranjit through a listserv where Ranjit had sent out, uh, which is in early 2019, even before COVID pandemic had come into play, uh, where uh, he sort of sent out on this listserv and where he, we, we decided to have a chat. And we realized we had multiple people that were in our circles. But then the, the absolutely difficult and awesome task. I say awesome because you had people come in from very different backgrounds who were able to come in and contribute to the parables of in parables of AI in and from the global south conversation. And from there to here today, and again, this is, I believe, a journey, right? It's not the, the conclusion at all. What has struck me very, um, you know, absolutely kind of apparently is that uh, big fan of the idea of situated knowledge, right? What Haraway says, what situated knowledge, but we each have our own epistemic points. We come from, we have situated knowledge, but to move from situated knowledge to situated learning 
is what this AI primer has given us. So that's something that, and I, and I, I think we all owe a huge round of applause to Rigo, Ranjit, and Sarita for being able to, you know, have all of these people with very disparate interests and voices and their ability to get all of them together. And I must acknowledge, um, you know, one person who's been along with Sarita, Rigo, and Ranjit has been a major influence on my own work, which is Paula, right? So I've, I've been very influenced, not only by Paula's work, um, the way she's able to kind of model the empathetic pedagogue, one who's community oriented, who's brilliant in her, in her work critical, but just using the community as the anchor to have that conversation. So I think that's what I've, you know, it's a very humbling process to be honest with you, to come here every day to learn new things. The primer, I don't think it's, it's again, I said garden of 14 paths because there is, it's not hypertext. Hypertext has its limitations, right? This does not have limitations because it comes from humans who have interpreted the idea and then allowed new paths to come. So because there's lots of people, I would stop here. But again, thank you for the opportunity. That's all I'm going to say. Thank you. Thank you, Divya. And uh, emphasizing your point that there are many people who have contributed to this who are not present in this call right now. Paola. Uh, Record Quijón as being one, one of the major figures among others. So shout out to uh, Paola and Tierra Común community. Um, Paola specifically has been a key figure in helping us translate this primer and emphasizing how important it is to, to move forward in this conversation of, uh, of the majority world in a multilingual way. Like, no questions asked it is it is not something that we can compromise on and in this case we you know we're limited by time budget and other things so we only did the spanish translation you know it is our hope and intent that down the line we have a multiplicity of of of, of languages and tongues that are able to you know uh, move this text into that direction uh, but sticking with this thread of translation, I, I now want to bring in someone who has taught me so much about the importance of language justice and how um, critical it is to bring language justice into the technology space. And that is uh, our friend Soledad Magnone, who really is a major advocate of, of this, uh, particularly coming from a Latin American perspective. So Sole, I want to and pass the mic now to you to kind of talk about what it was like to contribute to this primer, um, how is it connected to some of your work around language justice, and just your overall kind of feelings um, at the end of this cycle. Thank you so much. And for me, it's a privilege to, to be here with you. Um, it was a project that was very much fun like starting with the workshops with the parables um in and from the global south that was kind of chaotic and very intense days and then we had like that marathon of listening to stories that was amazing a full day online talking about situated learning and 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 the internet that's i think it's amazing and a lot of like a very fruitful land to explore as well how the internet is connected or or enabling this, this um, situated learning too. And that experience was amazing. And then it continued to the reviewing process of, of, the, um, uh, of the primer and conversations through Google, Doc, um, Google Docs that were really interesting as well as a way of uh, learning and, and, and connecting and, and contributing. Um, and the, the Spanish version was actually a surprise. I'm always trying to have everything in in English and Spanish, I, um, I'm particularly working on the intersections between digital education, between digital technologies, education and human rights. And the conversation is so much being built in English and that's so um, problematic. And I'm trying to co-create these educational practices with different stakeholders like academics, researchers, technologists, youth educators, 
Um, and I see myself as a facilitator and uh, in that facilitator role, being the bridge with the language, uh, I think that it has been key uh, for me. But looking at the primer in Spanish was also very much illuminating, finding the words uh, and identifying collectively which are the words <laughs> for these terms that we're so much used to. Um, um, just, uh, yeah, in, in, in general, particularly in, 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 in academics. And the great challenge, so for me, the primer is, it's, it's a key resource to bridge this gap in digital education that we have currently. I'm, uh, the exploration of these digital education practices are very much about then advocating for this to be included in, in curriculum. So I think this resource is fundamental. It's a starting point for me as well. I think I'm looking forward to including it in the next projects and breaking it down into other ways of, uh, um, into more multimedia resources and making it more accessible and translating it into different uh, languages too. And it's also an invitation for others to contribute into that. So it's different perspectives too. And that's the, the key thing that makes this project quite uh, unique. Um, yeah, and, uh, and promising as well. So thank you so much for the adventure. I wanna bring in Nicolas here uh, to talk about some of these same threads. But before I pass the mic to you, Nico, uh, Dibia, you say you were based in in Leeds right now? Yes, yes, Rigo. And Sole, you are currently based where? Uh, on my way to Finland, in between Uruguay and Europe. Um, cool. Yes. And Ranji, you are? I'm in upstate New York. I've been living here for the last 10 years. I never left. <laughs> <laughs> And Sarita mentioned uh, in her remarks that uh, she is currently based in Carnarvon territory, aka Brooklyn, New York. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to kind of begin to to emphasize that this this is a uh, international call, <laughs> calling in from many many places. Uh, Nicolas, beginning with you now, or going next to you, um, tell us where you're calling in from and what this process has been for you specifically around the the process of the kind of editorial process you have been one of the key contributors i think in in uh, not only the translation uh, to the spanish but also the the kind of sentence level editorial uh, process of, of creating a, a text-based document uh, some of your contributions were so um astute and and poignant that i, I kind of wanted to ask you like are you an editor uh, in your day-to-day -day? do you do you is this what you do because uh, you offer some of the best kind of editorial remarks um that that i that i've seen so passing it to you um to kind of share how you're feeling hi everybody i'm calling in from sao paulo brazil I'm from Colombia, but I've been living here for the past decade or so. So first of all, I wanted to thank Sarita, Rigo, Ranjit, and all of the people that are here and those who are not present uh, for the generosity, the attention, for creating this amazing space that became like a constant, ever-growing collective body of research. So thank you for allowing us to be a part of the whole process. Um, and Getting back to your question, Rigo, yeah, I work as an editor at, two, at a social science magazine based here in Brazil, Ruiz Rosa, and I work also in programming history in the Spanish section. So it's part of my daily work to see text as a really detailed process of crafting the better version of what we're trying to say. And I think it links with several contributions that uh, everybody said here about the ethos of the parables event. The process of reading the stories of the participants was really beautiful. And the capacity of the authors to listen to our contributions was really uh, humbling and inspiring. So I think the event itself that had a really well-designed format uh, came true in the primer. 
uh, the workshop was based around this idea of breaking stereotypical assumptions of AI using parables as a way to see and tell our lived experience and go beyond binarism. And I think that format, the idea that Sarite had of bringing a really defined way to tell the stories from different paths, it's really present in the, in the primer itself, right? And um, I remember Christine Mungai from Bazar Lab on her uh, talk telling us about how stories were resomatic practices in motion. And I think this primer, the result also works in, in that way, right? So in regards to the translation, I had a really fun time, as Soledad said, it was one of the most rewarding processes uh, in a collective trans translation process that is always difficult, right? Like Soledad from Uruguay and Paula from Mexico and from Colombia, we have different ways of telling the same story with the same language. And the idea of using an inclusive language in the Spanish version was really interesting and really challenging as well. Uh, I was always thinking about how to do that in Portuguese. So it was like a back and forth idea of trying to find the best word to explain the same thing in an expanding context. And the result is just unbelievable. I, I can think of different ways of seeing applications and ways of defining it, like methodological, pedagogical, epistemological living tool that is based on connections and situated knowledges that understand and try to forge new implications of bodies, territories, and, and fields. Uh, so I'm really happy to be a part of this. I'm really humble as, as Diva said, and thinking about the next steps that we can do to continue working on the several iterations that this, this amazing process has brought. Gracias, Nico. Muchas gracias. Uh, we just lost Kim Fernandez. Uh, they had to head out, but I want to just say uh, in their absence uh, how uh, amazing it's been to collaborate with Kim. Uh, Kim is one of the, the, the people that I've met through this process that has really influenced my, um, my understanding, particularly from an accessibility perspective, um, how to complicate this conversation and how to bring in uh, a more genuine kind of uh, <clears throat> caring uh, community-based approach to, to creating this work. Um, but last and not least uh, in this call uh, that I wanna hear from is you, Vasu. Um, you have also been a really consistent presence and voice uh, throughout this process, beginning with the workshop um crafting your own story which is now in in the process of publication i want to hear from you how are you feeling um what it has meant for you to co contribute to to this work and kind of where you're at Hi, everybody. Um, it's truly been very humbling um when I started with parables, it, it first of all, data and society has always been this one organization that I always wanted to, you know, work on and I followed their work for years. So to have, like, to be a part of that event was itself, like, such a big thing for me, big deal for me. And then when I started, like, writing the stories, I did it, like, in one night and, like, everything personal just came out and I sent it. And when I heard from you, and then the conversation started. Uh, so I got a community or cohort to discuss all of these things with, which I never had ever gotten before that when I was in the computer science, like typically engineering sort of, you know, crowd. So that itself informed a lot. It's first of all, it validated a lot of my beliefs and like in my thought process, which is something that I, it's hard to get there. and. So when we started this conversation about, you know, creating this uh, syllabus, creating this place where people could come and sort of understand what is at play here, how AI is affecting them, how to basically situate yourself, represent yourself in a manner to reflect on your own, you know, opinions and beliefs and how you work, your practice, etc. 
So it, it's, it was very personal in the sense that, oh, okay, I'll also get to learn from it because this is something that I haven't done before. So to navigate that sort of, you know, way would be good for me. And when I started doing it, when I engaged in more and more conversations, just everything was just clubbed together in such a manner that it made so much sense of why I was, you know, thinking the way I was, why I was asking these questions for coding and why my colleagues were not. And why are other people like doing more than this and I'm just thinking. So to see that work in action, it is also inspiring in the manner that, okay, this, this could also be done. But just to see a new approach to code, just to see uh, uh, approach to where you situate yourself, how you situate yourself, that has been a very great sort of experience and learnings. And, and, and it was like really, it's really nice that I did this in the first year of my PhD. <laughs> So, so now again, I actually get on a good sort of path to move forward with it. And I am. And following that, I have had such good conversation with all of you, especially with the chapters also. And apart from that, from my work also, with the story also, you guys have helped me so much. So even that is helping me still it, it's still I'm in a like personal process for it to understand what's going on with me so that personal and professional balance that I've gotten because of this primer because of parables because of all of this people coming together responding to the story giving their feedback on it from different different perspectives all of that has given me a very new dimension to think about things and explain that dimension it's not that just you know that's it's a point that you can just get to. It's like, it's a set path that you can go there and new perspectives to inform that. So it's been a good year of this set. Thank you so much, Basu, for that share. Uh, okay, I'm gonna officially take off my facilitator hat and throw it away <laughs> with, the, with the hopes that this becomes an open conversation for the next, uh, 10 minutes or so that we have here together. Um, <clears throat> so the floor is open for for contributions. If, if we're even if we're interrupting each other, I'd like for now to be a little bit more more messy the conversation. Um, um, so the floor is open. Feel free to even unmute. I think I'm I'm ready. I'm ready to jump in. I mean, I, I, I was just listening to what everyone said and it was so amazing. But what really came to mind for me is one of the most amazing things about being grounded in community, anchored in community, is you have a bunch of people around you who can call, uh, call out when you're being opaque, just plain wrong or ridiculous. There's almost nothing I liked more about this process than that or when I was missing things. So just to give a really concrete example, we, we were trying to organize the material, but in a non-hierarchical way. So to get that balance right between finding actual paths that people could move through the material with without reinforcing rank, uh, hierarchy, and order, um, and we were coming up against this issue that, you know, we didn't want to prioritize books necessarily as the paragon of epistemological knowledge, but at the same time, we typically didn't want to reverse it and put the shortest possible piece of writing we could find because that's another kind of, um, that's another kind of value setting, implicit hierarchization. So we started thinking about these categories that come to be start, explore, extend. And to be quite honest, I was coming up with categories that made absolutely no sense. I must have been in a period where I was hungry all the time because my categories were like first course, main, main meal, dessert. And thank goodness, you know, very, very kindly, of course, both Randeep and Rigo sort of came in and said, I don't quite understand. I think one of my categories was dig in. I was very attached to it. I thought it was very clever. And, you know, one of the best, just getting out of the felicitation mode and getting into the real, like, nitty gritty of the work mode, one of the things that I so value about this community is having people 
around me who can very gently and kindly tell me when I'm thinking something that no one else uh, that makes sense to nobody else in the room um, and and that to me is amazing and there was a lot of that that's just one example that I remember very well but uh, we're talking so much about being attentive to the level of text and language and image and that that's a lot of what was going on you know on the back end as it were to to make the pro the thing happen and then the other thing that's so important to me is the the fact that this project shouldn't be closed that it should be open ended always open to critique because you know for me if if we in this room know how often Spanish voices, Spanish language voices are excluded, or you know, Hindi language voices, Bhojpuri language voices are excluded from these discussions. Then we also must know that our whatever we produce is also producing its own erasures and silences. And it's very important to me that this project remain open in that way, through always adding voices to the room. I agree. I think, you know, one of the, along these lines, one of the things that we struggled with a lot was um, thinking about authors and thinking about, you know, are we citing somebody too often in the work or not? And we kind of made an explicit decision at some point of time that we will not cite authors more than twice or thrice. Uh, it was simultaneously a way to basically ex extend, you know, who gets, uh, you know, uh, into into the list that we are building, but at the same time, it was also this process of thinking through um, how do we actually ensure that you know uh, there is a much broader kind of voices that we can actually uh, get involved with and think with uh, in in the process of making this primer, um, and that to a certain extent brought up uh, quite an interesting set of issues. So you know, for example. There's something odd about the primer where you know there's an indent on some of the texts and uh, and you know at at other places there's not, and it's confusing. But at the same time, it's a design to ensure that you know if the top code which is not indented is connected to a, a group or uh, an author, and we still want to cite some more work of theirs, but you know at the same time ensure that you know our original principle of just having one or two citations of the same person in the entire. Uh, primer says the same uh it was kind of intended that indent was our compromise in a way we were trying to ensure that you know it still remains the the flavor of what we are trying to do remains there but at the same time we are able to acknowledge that you know there are a wide variety of work that authors do in the space uh and sometimes it's difficult to actually represent all of it uh so compromises abound but at the same time it was a fun exercise to actually think through these challenges of you know what to cite what not to cite uh, the zotero itself has about more than 500 citations so you know literally for every uh five citations in the library there's only one that made it to the primer and it's an important part of the kind of erasure that sarita is talking about as well I was going through my notes yesterday and I found a lot of things that we discussed in the earlier meetings that we had and so much amazing stuff like really profound reflections on the format, the way we should tackle each reference, what was the epistemological trait that we should use, what were, what could be the implications of that use. Uh, really deep and structured discussions around detailed aspects of building learning tools and research collective movements. Um, really interesting as the whole process itself uh, from the event that I think is like a standing part of the whole primer to the result is just really beautiful to see how we advance and really took the time to think about the implications of each decision that doesn't happen that frequently right so i just wanted to share with you the list of things that i found <clears throat> just for for our listeners and our viewers um i want to 
pull on one thing that, that Nico has shared from this list of questions. Um, <clears throat> a project of epistemic justice, if we use it as an organizing principle, what are the implications? I mean, <clears throat> these are some of the questions that, that come up when you're working at, at this level, um, which is highly symbolic. You know, yesterday, last night I was at <clears throat> an organizing meeting with people doing direct action, kind of using direct action kind of tactics um, around a particular struggle happening in, in Atlanta. And they had a slide up, the organizer had a slide up that said, we're not interested in dichotomies uh, uh, of violence or nonviolence. They were speaking from kind of an anarchist perspective, but um, they said, we're not interested in, in, in moving from a place of dichotomy. So we don't believe in violence or nonviolence. We don't believe in symbolic or direct uh, actions. We were kind of open to the whole toolkit, whatever works. Um, <clears throat> and one of the things that, you know, I, I've been kind of, as an organizer myself, been thinking about is the power of symbolic interventions. Um, and in the case of, you know, producing a, a text-based document, um, some people might argue that these things don't make uh, a difference, but what I've kind of learned over the course of producing this, this, this artifact is that conversations are material. Conversations are um, another form of direct action because uh, something as kind of um, seemingly inconsequential as deciding whether to, to use this word or that word at the margins of a Google document, uh, that is exactly where these kind of decisions of power get made or like the, the, the weight and the meaning of, of language is, is often what leads to some of these material grounded realities. Um, and so kind of creating a document, a text-based document together with a group of people coming from very different perspectives is in itself uh, a tactic and a strategy to, to deploy, um, which I think is very well illustrated in this primer. I would recommend also to particularly highlight the process of creating it and like what you learned or um, in trying to have it, for example, for data and society and for other academic organizations that are trying to pursue similar um, activities, which are the recommendations or uh, how would you continue this, this process or how you think this ginger could continue growing. Um, I think academic organizations have a lot to learn and trying from this kind of process, they're so hierarchical and closed. And I don't know, for me, that's the way of making projects participatory or collaborative. That's the, the way that it they make sense. I don't know if it's like imposter syndrome. I never feel like I know enough of a specific subject. So I always bring different people together. Um, and it's a way of ensuring that people are understanding what you're trying to say, as Sarita was saying and collectively making sense of these concepts and, and contributing um, to the knowledge. Um, and for me, it was text, but as, as I was reading the, the different iterations of the, of the primer, I was instantly thinking of images, of movies, of all the potential that it has to do like uh, image-based books or exhibits. So I think for me, I would be really interested in trying to implement a project connecting these into more um, yeah, multimedia or, or image-based, video-based um, content and, and, uh, and contributions from, from around the world. So I'm really excited about that part. Cool. Well, um, go ahead, Vasu. Yeah, so uh, like uh, when we were discussing uh, about the academic sort of resources to add, we also went away from this academic you know sources list and then we went to non-academic and non-conventional resources like podcast, cultural conversations, basically, people who are creating content 
because they're content creators, not, but it is a very good sort of scholarship. It has the potential to become like so much more, which is why I think the primer fits in so well with the cultural conversations because it's so intuitive in that manner. So it lets you navigate, even if you have like, if you have situated yourself in some manner, if you have uh, thought about where, just a simple conversation as cast, which we were working on. Just, just those conversations and how to navigate them in, in, in the structure and then how to you know frame the narrative. Those three categories are wonderful, by the way. So just, just to make those questions, to inform those questions, to create a pathway to traverse all of this, to navigate that from just one podcast, from resources that are not gen from especially from the people who are who don't have that much representation or their academic scholarship will fall through because of structural systematic systemic problems so in in those cases that non academic scholarship sort of has helped you know it it be a good step for because of this primer i think okay um in these last kind of closing minutes, I want to just offer my gratitude again. Um, beginning with with my my collab media collaborators Sarita Amrute and Raji Singh, Singh. Uh, it really has been amazing to work with you two uh, in generating this this primer and this this idea. Um, you have become you know, two of my closest collaborators at DNS. And um, it's really been a blessing as, you know, as we try to bring these conversations around epistemic justice in technology um, uh, to the foreground. Uh, I've learned so much from both of your scholarship and the rigor that you bring to your research practices. And I consider you part of my intellectual community. So, I'll I'll leave it at that as my final words. And if you want to offer any closing remarks, uh, please go ahead. Uh, just very quickly, um, when I was applying for a job at Data and Society, one of the questions that Rigo asked me was, "Who are your people?" And two years down the line, now I can say that you guys are my people. Thank you. I don't like closing, so I'm not going to say anything. I just I'm looking forward to continued conversations with all all of you, and yeah, but just echoing, you are my people. I think that's a great way to put it. Beautiful. I'm going to stop the recording now, and then we can just close out together without the pressure of saying anything meaningful. <laughs>